uh, ACA was giving, when I was in Phoenix, ACA apparently was giving away free COVID. I forgot about it and didn't realize they were giving it away till the, about right before my presentation. And uh, so I missed the presentation, but uh, provided the slides. And I we had also done a salary survey that we provided and I have sent that to Katie. And that salary survey really looked at all states and broke it into like the minimum end, the top end, but also intermediate salaries. Uh, and that can be provided. Uh, you can reach out to me or else uh, I think Katie or CLA, we can get you that salary information where we just put together what we got from the survey. Uh, just real quick and then I'll hush and we'll kind of go through whatever you'd like to cover. Uh, obviously lots of states dealing with shrinking workforce, difficulties in recruiting and retention. Uh, Texas, uh, just like many of you, definitely struggling. If you want to feel really good about your numbers, ask me mine and I'll tell you and it'll make you feel better. Because uh, unfortunately, because we're a large system, we've got a lot of vacancies. But a lot of states have been doing some really uh, cool and innovative things to try to help recruiting and retention. Uh, some of those include uh, QR codes for things like applications, uh, that's like Tennessee and New York, lots of people doing new things on social media, some states doing apps, Georgia and a couple of others actually have apps for employees where you have to connect with them. People are using not just Facebook, but TikTok, um, you know, Montana, Florida doing some new creative things as it relates to social media. A lot of states have talked about uh, reevaluating qualifications. Some have eliminated pre-employment testing. Uh, Minnesota and Texas, I uh, believe both in those. Uh, minimum age requirements, some states were looking at lowering minimum age requirements from say 21 down to maybe 18. In Texas, we we're 18, but have been that way for a long time. Uh, some were also looking at uh, promotion timelines. Louisiana did some really good work in moving up their promotion guidelines so that, that you can move up the chain quicker in their guidelines. And also folks had looked at giving credit for time at other agencies. I know in Texas, if they came to Texas from another state or a jail or another where they're getting correctional experience, we'll give them that many years experience on our career ladder. And I think some others were doing that. Uh, recruiting military, definitely a topic of big discussion. Uh, Florida, Virginia, uh, doing lots on that. A lot of people also talked about flexible schedules, uh, doing part time, but also even letting people pick shifts when that's uh, possible and looking at other options as far as the work schedules to try to be more, more friendly. Uh, as it relates to retention, uh, Arkansas, New Hampshire, others had done really good communication tools with social media, being able to reach out to their employees and highlight those employees through social media. Again, I talked about Georgia having an app, but that's a really cool communication tool. Um, Louisiana, Peter Blanc and their team, did focus groups on work, working groups and uh, staff retention from all the levels at the bottom end all the way to the top end and made recommendations and made some changes for their agency that were, were very good. And then looking at more staff friendly policies, California, Colorado, Texas. Uh, also dress code uniforms, cell phone policies, Ohio, Idaho, I know were two jurisdictions that have changed their cell phone posture. I think Ohio will let you bring it in. Idaho has a process where I think you can also bring it to a, either in all the way or to a certain degree. Uh, Ohio doing retention bonuses, referral bonuses being made in South Carolina, Texas, and Tennessee. Other, other discussions we've had in the committee about uh, things states are doing to look at culture and really the longer term retention of employees, but that's a very fast uh, kind of update on, on where, where those um, things that we've talked about in the past few months have been in the committee and some updates on what we've done. Lots of states have done pay packages. Uh, some states are seeing results, some are not. Uh, Texas, we haven't announced it, but we'll actually announce it Monday next week. Uh, we're going to do a 15% across the board for our correctional employees, which will help hopefully on the front end and the back end for our correctional employees, but several other states have done uh, 10, 15, some states even more. Nebraska may be holding the award for the highest, highest watermark, because if I'm not mistaken, I think Nebraska's starting pay is around 56. Now, I know California, there may be some other states that are higher, but for states that haven't traditionally been that high, um, those are good, are good numbers. Um, again, we have a correctional officer pay survey that we did do. Uh, and gather information and we have that available. So I can get you that chart if you'd like to have that or CLA can help you get that as well. So that's 
five minutes of auctioneer talking real quick to try to get us to the point where we can really listen to each other, which is, I think, the biggest value of the call uh, is really learning what anyone else may be doing. Uh, Texas, I'll give you just a little snippet. I just talked about the pay increase, but we're also doing uh, stun fencing and other to essentially eliminate man towers on our facilities as well. That's gonna take longer, probably a year to 18 months to get that done. But at the same time, we're kicking off both those initiatives to try to help reduce our staffing footprint, but also look at what we can do on the retention and recruiting. And with that, what I can do at this point, I've got a couple of people up. Um, if you wanna raise your hand and roll or, or raise your hand, I can kick it to you. And if you have a question or tell us what you're doing in your jurisdiction, that would be helpful to all of us. And I think that's the value of the call, hopefully. Not all at once, of course. So for those of you that aren't aware, if you look to the bottom right of your screen, there should be an icon down there that says reactions. If you click on that, it has a raised hand um, area. Just click on that. It'll bring you to the front screen because I think we have three total screens here. And that way, uh, Director Collier will be able to see you and call on you. Perfect. Anne-Marie? Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Brian. Uh, Anne-Marie Domenio from California, I'm Deputy Director of Peace Officer Selection and Employee Development. And I have some other of my colleagues on the call today, but I do wanna talk about a couple of things that we've done in California that has really helped, um, I think, increase our application numbers over the last several months. We've seen almost a threefold increase in applications um, through our social media campaign. Um, we're doing some geofencing and targeted media campaign. Rosanna Rodriguez, um, who's just appeared on your screen, um, is our manager over our recruitment efforts. Um, some other things that we're doing though, in terms of making it, I think more um, accessible to folks to get through our process is we're holding what we call jumpstart events. And at those events, they can accomplish all of their testing, their fingerprinting and get into what we call our uh, background process um, through one event. So they don't have to schedule multiple opportunities to complete the written exam, the physical exam, the fingerprinting, and then what we call ESOF, which is our background process um, that's um, web-based. Um, and so we've seen a percentage uptick of almost 50% of staff, or excuse me, of candidates that we'd normally lose throughout that process. When you do it all on one day, you don't lose them. They're all there for the whole day to complete the process. The other thing we do is called Fast Track, um, or Fast Pass as I like to call it, because it reminds me of Disneyland, which is we have hard to fill institutions in geographically challenging locations in California. If our candidates agree to, um, be stationed at one of our hard to fill institutions, we put them in front of the line. Um, and we do so because obviously we have tremendous vacancies at some of our locations. Um, so those are a couple of things that we've done to keep folks in process. I think Rosanna might be able to share a little bit more if you guys are interested on how we've been able to dramatically um, increase our number of applications in California. So um, Rosanna, if you have anything you'd like to share, I think it might be helpful to the group. Sure, thank you, Anne-Marie. Hi, I'm Rosanna Rodriguez. Um, so one of the main things that have helped to increase our applications is we hired a marketing vendor um, to, to do the programmatic marketing for us through social media. They're also doing Google ads. And what we're finding is the social media marketing is what I think is bringing in those applicants that we haven't been able to reach um, yet. A lot of our applications come from friends and family of the department. So they are our best recruiters out there sharing with their family and friends about the career. And so a lot of our applicants, um, eight out of 10, know a friend or family from the department. Um, but through social media, we have been able to tap into this audience that we haven't been able to reach before. Um, so these are people that don't have family within the department um, that may or may not be interested in law enforcement, but we've at least uh, perked their interest through some ads that we're utilizing. And a lot of the targeting that we're doing through this marketing vendor 
gender um, is uh, diversity uh, targeted. So we are highlighting our diverse staff. We're sharing stories um, of how they came to the department. Um, specifically, we have a, a sergeant. Uh, she's a female. She came to our. She came to the United States from Africa. Couldn't read or write English. Um, and put herself through school. She is now a sergeant with um, the Department of Corrections. And we have her on a poster that share her story that she's a single mom able to raise her family and she still supports her family back in Africa. So what we're trying to um, show is the diverse workforce that we have within our department to attract um, those diverse applicants um, to come to our department. But I think what the main thing that I think Anne Marie hit was um, the marketing vendor and then our most recently our jumpstart event because we do see 50% no-show at the written and another 50% no-show at the physical fitness test. But having it all on one day, we're having the 100% no-show rate. And I think they're invested because they're already into the background process in one day that typically would take them about three months. Thank you very much. That's, that's awesome. Anyone have any questions real quick from Cal about California? If not, Anne-Marie, Rosanna, thank you very much. Very good information. Patricia? Thanks. Um, so I had two questions. Um, what we're experiencing is, um, so my first question is, the number of applications that we get in the first instance um, is much lower than it used to be. We used to get... I think, you know, we used to get thousands now, you know, we don't get thousands of applications anymore. Um, and, you know, there's this conversation that goes on among the law enforcement family that this is a result of bias against law enforcement right now, given a, a lot of the turmoil that's occurred in the last couple of years involving law enforcement um, and how it's just not an attractive profession anymore and people don't wanna work in law enforcement anymore. And, I'm wondering if any of, and, and what I can say is that the, that the police agencies in my state are experiencing the very same struggles in recruitment as we are. So I was wondering if, um, if you all thought that, that, it, that that's real, is that real that, that, you know, this, or is it mythology that there's this bias against working in law enforcement? And if, and if it is real, how do we, does anyone have any good ideas on how to get past that? Um, so that was my first question. I don't know if you wanna, if anyone has any wisdom to offer on that. Two things I can tell you, Patricia, cause I, I, I don't know if I have the complete answer on that because I think there could be to some degree, some of that involved, but at the same time, at least the, the studies that I've looked at show that there have been a higher percentage of baby boomers that have retired earlier than anticipated in the workforce over and I think COVID did that accelerated those retirements yeah. and then there are less younger folks coming into the workforce in general and as some of the articles I've read there's a couple of good ones in Forbes and a few other ones that that I can share if you'd like but just kind of talk about how this was somewhat predicted it just got escalated with COVID that there was going to be a workforce shortage and, and because I know at least in Texas we're feeling it law enforcement's feeling it but so are Health and Human Services, so are private businesses, so are lots of other you know entities. I don't know anyone who's really well um, as far as hiring, at least in Texas. But I can only speak from that perspective. But um, I don't think that, at least for us, is the controlling issue. And I can again mute, and anyone else wants to get in on that, feel free. Maybe not. So, yeah, okay. Sure. Well, so my second question is a little more nitty gritty, and it's this: um, we had always, for reasons, frankly, none of us really understood, but we had always had this dynamic where half of those eligible to come to our physical fitness test, which is after the written test, um, half of those eligible, you know, those invited basically, or those scheduled for that day would actually show up and then half of those would pass. Um, that is, is a dynamic that I don't even see anymore. We had a PT test uh, two Saturdays ago and in the morning session, 
we were expecting 65 candidates. Now, these are people that have passed our written exam. 15 showed up and eight passed. Um, and in the afternoon, we were expecting around another 70. 11 showed up and zero passed. So, I mean, I'm in a situation where I have more training instructors at the PT test than I do candidates. And we have done, I swear, everything short of going to these people's houses and picking them up and driving them to the PT test. And we're just sort of like at a loss. It's really demoralizing, particularly for the training academy. Um, we just, I wonder, is anyone else experiencing this? And how do you get people to follow through once they've applied, once they've taken and passed a written test? Like, how do you keep them? How do you keep them? I like the idea of the jump start and the, you know, the, the doing everything all at once. I wrote that down. I think that's, that's a really good idea. I'm wondering is, 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 is there anything else anyone has an idea about, about keeping people in that process? Let me ask you this. How long is the process now currently from the time that you, um, from the time that they make initial application to what would be their higher date, I guess. So on the call, I have my assistant director who oversees the training academy, and I believe I have the head of our training academy. I don't know if either one of them heard that question, Wayne or Corey, if you want to weigh in on the details. I did. This is uh, Wayne Salisbury, assistant director. I actually ran the training academy up to about a year and a half ago. Uh, generally, we have a, a continuous recruitment uh, process ongoing, which we've done pretty much for the last year and a half. And generally, uh, once they do the application, we'll schedule them for the written exam and then give them a 30 day notice in preparation time for the physical agility test. So from there, obviously our traditional hiring process, but we've been moving it along pretty steadily. Uh, so after the physical agility, we'll do an NCIC uh, BCI uh, check, and then we'll go into a full background investigation followed by an oral interview. If they pass the oral interview and in the background investigation, they'll get a conditional offer of hire in which they'll get a drug testing, a medical screening, and a psychological evaluation. Um, and subsequently, if they pass those three, um, they'll basically uh, be prepared to attend our training academy. Uh, so we, we've been moving that along steadily um, and time frame wise depending on when we're gonna run the academy and what it has really dragged us out, quite frankly, as uh, the director pointed out, is getting the candidates in the door, um, short of driving to the houses and you know, put them on the bus and, and getting them in to the process uh, steps. It's, it's been a real challenge. Uh, so if you were to compress it, traditionally state service, you know, we move pretty slow, but uh, in these cases, we've, we've gone from our traditional ways to uh, much more accommodating ways. Uh, we've even offered up for the written exam and the physical agility test times uh, of the day uh, at their option or a particular day that's more convenient for them by letting them schedule themselves rather than the traditional way of saying, hey, this is uh, the time and the day that you're going to come. So what are we talking? Two months? So I think two months would probably be on the short end because of trying to get all those people into in, into the process. Um, but we, you know, probably more to five to six because of the sheer numbers. If I had numbers, that's one thing. Um, but as the director pointed out, you know, last Saturday we did that PT test and you had 130 people scheduled and you had 26 people show up, eight people pass. And we're trying to run classes uh, from 50 to 60 candidates at a time, rather than running, you know, five different classes throughout the year. And it's 12 week academy. So there's a lot of resources and energy expended for that. Right. I think the only thing I can think of is, you know, generally when you're out looking for a job, you, you want a job, right? You want a job within the next two weeks. <laughs> um, so for it to be a five or six month process, that might be part of Part of you know seeing if you can dwindle that down somewhat make that a little shorter some kind of way yep younger younger especially with the younger people because they want things right now right they want to go in and leave out and say i've got a job 
And, and they want to be promoted in two weeks in. Tomorrow. That's right. They'll get the job today and want to be promoted tomorrow. <laughs> Patricia, we moved about three, four years ago, maybe. So our pre-employment, the physical, the, the pet, or essentially the agility test, we put it into the academy. We used to do it prior and make it a condition of hiring. It may be required in state law or something like that in, in Rhode Island, I'm not sure. For us, it wasn't. So what we did was moved it into the academy. We hired a guy who uh, came in, David Yebra. He came in with a military background and kind of questioned that up front for us, basically, because in the military, you're going to pass your physical agility as you get out of your academy, as you graduate your training class. So that's that's how we did it. We moved it inside. I don't think we've had hardly any failures, but the goal and the pressure point is really you've got to complete that to get through your training academy. And for the most part, we've had good success rates with them completing it in the academy. I think we did it that way at one point in Rhode Island. Um, I think the concern, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So I think one of the concerns was if you bring someone into the academy and they're not in any kind of shape, they're not going to, they're going to get hurt. They're not going to do well in the PT program in the academy. But I think there's value in rethinking that, you know, timeline, that model. We had been sued by the Department of Justice um, and in, in our, our this close to closing it, um, the lawsuit, um, based on our written test, based on some uh, unintentional uh, adverse impact to certain minority groups in our written test. And so we didn't hire anyone for like three years. We paused our recruitment process for that long while that was really hot. So that put us way behind the eight ball. Um, and then, um, uh, as, as, as we've gone back to running our recruitment process and, and our academies, we've been very hesitant to change, make any major changes to that process until the DOJ goes away. Um, so I'm hopeful that once that lawsuit is closed out that we will have some, some comfort in making some tweaks to our process that hopefully will we'll get more people in the door. But I appreciate it, thank you. Lee? Brian there, thank you, sir. Um, there was one thing I wanted to mention, and, and just like Dave Marie had mentioned, we're doing the rapid hiring of agents. And one other thing that we did was the gave the wardens authorization as they moved through the process as quickly as they could get somebody to complete the phases of the, of the hiring process. We're not waiting on a training date. We're going ahead and bringing folks to work and getting them on the payroll. Um, we've seen that as a huge benefit for us. We, we, we're not losing as many people waiting on academy seats. And the other thing that helped us with that is we busted up our, our formal academy uh, as far as the, the static academy. And we farmed the instructors out to the field to join the field training officers, the field training instructors. And we're doing regional academies. So uh, as soon as we get an academy complete, we're starting another academy in, in the field. Um, and Richard Muckle or, or Dr. Carter could help me, but I think we're running as many as four, if not five academies at one time, uh, five classes at a time. And, and that's been helpful to us because a lot of the folks did not want to leave their home and go away for you know, several weeks uh, because of how, not housing, but you know, they may have children, they may be single parents, and it made it more difficult for them to go to the traditional academy setting and in the exit surveys from training, that's what we're hearing a lot of is that you do have some that want to go to an academy, but the regional academy has been extremely helpful to, to others that may have, you know, uh, something that would make it harder for them to be away from home for several weeks at a time. Um, I did want to mention, if you don't mind, Director, that some of the things that we've done in Tennessee that you touched on, but then some of the impact as well. Um, you know, in December, December the 16th, the governor's office here was good enough to allow us to implement a 30, a maximum 30, or excuse me, minimum 37% increase up to a maximum 15% increase across the security series. So our new officers start at 44.5 and after a year, they go to 46.7, I believe it's almost $47,000. And then all the way up through the associate warden level got a, at least a 15% pay increase um, so that we could address compression. And what, what that's done for us is we've seen a 23.1% decrease in our staff in our vacancy rate. So far, we've hired almost 300 folks. 
and we've been able to retain 50% more people than we were uh, before. So our two month, you know, departure rate that we were seeing of staff leaving through attrition, no matter what it was, whether they were uh, just resigning to go to another job, whether they were resigning because this just wasn't for them, whether they were retiring or whether unfortunately we were having to dismiss folks, we were seeing folks leave half a, half as often. So our two month rate was was what we were seeing in you know two months uh, has decreased. So um, that's just a couple of things, um, you know. And I, I want to give kudos to Dr. Carter, uh, Dorinda Carter, and her staff for a lot of the work that's been done with our recruitment uh, efforts. The other thing I failed to mention is that we have a five thousand dollar sign on bonus on top of that forty four five. Um, and then we have the referral bonus that you mentioned. You can refer as many people as you want. Um, and if they get through the process, you get $1,000 for each person. But some of the other stuff that Dr. Carter's folks have done, um, you know, is like uh, a Facebook challenge. So the, our HR director put up a little cash out of his own pocket. And then Director Carter and then put the, this Facebook challenge out there. And the person that was able to recruit uh, you know, that had, I guess, had more hits on their Facebook page from their, their recruitment efforts away from work. They, uh, you know, they kind of won a prize from our HR director. Our social media presence uh, that her group is, has been spearheading is outstanding. You know, we're using billboards, radio ads, bowling alley ads uh, in some of the smaller areas, the smaller communities. We've upped our game with re employee recognition where we're identifying the heroes among us. We're really pushing out our Valor Awards for folks that, you know, if it meets the, the requirements for the Valor or Life Saving Awards. Dr. Carter's folks have developed um, a recognition program called the Badge. Um, we're getting out with the Commissioner's Coin of Excellence, uh, where I presented that this morning here at one facility in West Tennessee to a couple of officers that, um, that will probably get the Life Saving or Valor Award, but this is just an immediate response to them where they stopped it, where another employee was involved in an accident and there was smoke coming out from under the hood of the car, tree falling on the car and one of the employees crawled under the tree, uh, you know, and was able to pry the car door open and she pulled another employee to safety. So things like that and we're, Dr. Carter's folks are promoting that through our media channels as well as reaching out to traditional media. Uh, you know, we started the Augmentee program back in September where staff that have normally either moved on from security and other positions or they're not normally security. Everybody received training that wanted to come in to the facilities and assist or to augment the current staffing posture. Um, they received premium overtime for the hours over, you know, their regular work hours. We started a bonus program for that as well. So that if you worked at least 30 hours in a quarter, you got $500. If you worked at 90 plus hours, you got $1,800 in a quarter. And we're going to continue that. Um, another thing that happened there is those folks that are in the augmentee program that now make less for their normal hourly rate uh, than a CO1 makes that 44.5. If you come in and work a security post, then you're bumped up for those hours to 44.5 or time and a half of that 44.5. Uh, for the time that you're working overtime. We've seen some great numbers, tens of thousands of hours that have been worked by non-traditional security staff helping support our security efforts. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention the TV commercial um, that Dr. Carter's folks uh, developed, directed, produced, they did everything themselves. And I don't know if she can cue it up and with, you know, if you all want to see it, or if she can provide the link to our YouTube channel. Um, but I mean, this commercial is aired locally uh, in Nashville. I think she's bought airtime during either the SEC tournament or March Madness where these commercials are airing. And I mean, we're just statewide. We're getting a lot of great response with our QR codes, uh, you know, that takes you directly to the application, all of the other efforts, as well as what Dr. Carter's folks are doing. Uh, it's very impressive and we're, you know, knock on wood, we're going to continue to see the benefits unfold from this. I can share the link in the chat if that's okay. Uh -huh, perfect. Thank you, Lee and Dorinda. Thank you all both very much. Good information. You answered the one question I was going to ask you, which was, 
if you were not in a CO series, but you're working as a CO, you make less. Did you have any hurdles to clear to get that? Because I guess my CFO and my HR people tell us that we can't do that. You may have just answered my mm -hmm. question. Yeah, you can. You, you can, yes, sir. And what we did back in September, we started meeting weekly, myself, Dr. Carter, Richard Muckle, our general counsel, and our HR director with staff from the governor's office, the COO's office. And we started bringing in folks from our main HR, DOHR, and our finance and administration folks. So we're sitting at a table. When we want to do something, we're pitching that to the people that can get it done at the table every week. Now, we've started, we've started tittering off our, uh, the frequency of our meetings. But all we do is we come up with an idea, send it over to DOHR. DOHR looks at it and then pushes it on to finance and administration. And usually within a couple of three weeks, we've got our answer. The, hard, the biggest hurdle for us with being able to implement that, that step up in pay was that our computer and our IT infrastructure with payroll being able to create those codes uh, that would allow somebody, either the timekeeper or dependent on the employee, to key their time in under the new codes. Very good. Anyone have questions of Tennessee? And I'm not seeing any other hands up, so I just get to start randomly calling people. Jeff, you have anything you want to update us on? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, great ideas so far that I've been hearing from folks. I got some good notes here. So a um, couple thoughts for me uh, are, I like what California's doing. I think that's what we've seen here in Kansas. And I, and I know we employed it years ago in Idaho, kind of that um, fast track, uh, get it all done as quickly as you can. And I, and I, I think what I would say is for all of us, is to, uh, to really, really challenge the way we've always done it in the past. I mean, I'm meeting with a lot of resistance or some resistance at least from our wardens, from our work sites about doing things differently, um, uh, shortening the process, maybe a couple, couple of examples. Um, we have a, uh, we have a pre hire test. It's a, it's a either on online or paper test, and it asks people test them if they can perform a count, and it's got some reading and comprehension, and it doesn't take very long to do. But it, it's also got an observation, so they look at some photos, and then they have to tell us, you know, how many uh, how many inmates were in the photo, that type thing. I don't know that there's any value to that. I mean, a, a, a brand new person. These are entry level jobs. Gen generally, people are coming to us as an entry level person. They're not even sure they want to come to corrections, uh, work in a prison. And so I don't know what kind of trained observation skills they would have bringing them to this job. So I don't know if there's any value. So I think we're going to move away from that. Um, and, and then our, our, rec our recruitment strategies. Um, so our state portal is not very friendly. The application portal takes about 45 minutes. Probably if you were counting the clicks, it's probably a gazillion clicks to get through it. And, and our workforce today, that younger workforce, just isn't going to do that. So we've streamlined our own process using Q, the QR codes. And when you think about the competition that's out there, back to is it a, is it a anti law enforcement issue? I think that's part of it. But 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 a bigger part of it is uh, the private sector's up their game. You know whether it's Wendy's or Amazon or Walmart, their pay is better, their benefits are better, and to get to apply for and get a job is like that quick. And we can't, we can no longer afford to move at the speed of government. So really consolidating, shortening our processes, capturing these folks just as quickly as we can. And we're doing the same thing. We're, we've shortened it. We've got the QR codes. We're, we're on Indeed and other platforms where, where we've had great success as opposed to the state portal. One of our facilities in the last three weeks, a uh, female facility here in Topeka, has had like 78 job apps in the last uh, applications, applicants in the last three weeks through just Indeed. And we've had four through the state job portal. 
So it, just a good indicator that that's not working for us. Um, shorten it up, capture them. We've done everything but drive to their house and grab them. And I think we've even met them off site when we needed to, to do it. So, um, and, and then, so that's on the recruitment side. On the retention side, um, all the appreciation, um, user more user friendly policies. I agree with that. We've gone to the cell phones here, uh, like Idaho and Ohio have done. Let people bring their phones. You know, again, our workforce. If you ask them to come in and spend eight, 10, 12 hours isolated from their families and their friends, that doesn't appeal to them at, at, at all. We haven't. We've had it in place about eight months here. Have not had any problems with cell phones. Um, and when you when you match staff cell phones, having them in their position possession compared to contraband cell phones that we find, uh, it's not not even close to being a problem. And then and and then again beyond the recognition and pay, and we got a pay plan. Um, some of it's temporary. It's based on somewhat what Nebraska did, although I don't think anybody's um, doing anything quite as robust as what Nebraska just upped their game. But, but right after that stuff, it's really that environment that we create for our staff. So we have, a, uh, many of you probably experienced this, we have a, um, uh, um, uh, our most acute mentally ill are in a housing unit that was designed for restrictive housing. And it's kind of a two-story affair. And when you go in there, the noise um, is, is awful with the concrete and the metal. And you go, I went out in, into that unit about a month ago and was out down there visiting with staff. And you're within three feet of the staff and you have to raise your voice, almost yell to communicate. And I think of our staff that are in there all day. So we're trying to find ways to um, soften that up, uh, do noise abatement, Get those staff rotated out of there a little more often things that go to wellness and uh and just taking care of those staff and i think if we create a better environment that'll help us uh with retention time will, time will tell time will tell though that's kind of some of the stuff that we're um we're focusing on but but i close it again with just challenge your folks to think differently and it's tough it's tough for folks to think differently Thank you, Jeff. Good information. Ms. Matthews. You may be muted. I'm so sorry. I was just steady chatting away. <laughs> Jeff, I wanted to ask you about your cell phone policy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Get more into the details of how that works. Yeah, I sure can. So um, if staff want to bring their personal cell phone, if they're assigned to a facility and they want to bring their personal cell phone in past the security checkpoint, there's a process where they, they fill out a form. There's always good forms in government. And they, they provide, um, they provide uh, the model of their cell phone, uh, the carrier, the cell phone carrier. They tell us the number, of course, who the owner is. And then they give us authorization that if the cell phone is lost or it's maybe taken from them by the by the population, we have authorization to, to kill the service so it doesn't become a, a threat to security. And then the parameters for the staff are they, they either have to keep it on their person or in a secure location while it's down in the facility. Of course, they're not to, not to have uh, our population on the phone with them. They're not to let it interfere with the course of their duties now. Now, if they're done doing a tear check and they want to jump on there and text somebody or they want to check social media, that, that's not a big deal to us. But just don't let it interfere um, with your duties. And th those, are, those are kind of the general parameters of it. Um, I, know, I know we did it years ago in Idaho, didn't have any problems there. And again, we're six months in and we haven't had any problems here. And it just really comes back. The other message, the other byproduct product of it is you're telling your staff, we trust you. And that's a big, powerful message when you think about it, particularly in these times when we're trying to retain people. That matters a lot to the staff. They do want to know that. They, they want to feel valued. They want to feel like they're, they're trusted and they, they can trust their leaders. So I agree with that. No, I think that's a very interesting, um, interesting way to do things that I hadn't thought of. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You bet. Jeff, do you think you would 
would it be okay for you to share maybe your form uh, with CLA if we wanted to grab it and look at it? Is that okay? Sure, sure. I could send, uh, Brian, maybe I could send you or send Kevin. I could send Kevin the policy with the form yeah. in it and stuff. It's pretty, pretty short and to the point. Okay. Okay. No, that'd, be, that'd be cool. Thank you. So, Mr. Collier, I'll just say a little bit about what Louisiana has done. Um, you know, we, we've done the same thing. We've gotten rid of our tests. So we had a test. Um, same thing, comprehension, math skills, um, things like that. And we just decided there really is, is no need for that. I don't know how much value we were getting out of that. Um, and it extended the, the time that it took to hire an employee. So we've gotten rid of the test. Um, we've lowered the years of service um, required for our master sergeant level. Initially, it was 13 years, um, but that was back when we had a lot of employees who stayed 13 years. Um, so we lowered it from 13 years to three years. Um, and I think we're talking about now lowering it down to one year. Um, express hiring events where they can do everything in one day. Um, those are really big. Um, and we those have been actually more successful than I thought they would be, but they do a little local advertising for it. Nothing major, nothing radio or television. You know, they'll put some signs out. Um, we'll put it on Facebook and that sort of thing. Um, but those have actually been very successful. Of course, we've gotten a couple of pay raises, small pay raises, um, nothing large like, like what we've heard from other states. So um, we'll keep that in mind and keep pushing for that. Um, QR codes for recruitment events. You know, these younger people are used to that technology. They've grown up with that technology. So um, we did that. We're actually in discussion now, Anne-Marie, I think with the company that you guys contract with, because um, we saw what they did for you guys. I was I did some research and read up on it and I was like, let me let me find these people. <laughs> so um, hopefully that that does help. We've done our own internal social media campaign um, and it's been helpful, but I think if we can have a professional company come out and do that targeted um, recruitment like that, that hopefully we'll see the same success that you guys saw. So we've been busy. We've changed a lot of our policies, trying to be more um, adaptable, um, more kind of employee friendly, making sure that um, we keep diversity in mind um, when it comes to our employees. That's important, especially, you know, I keep going back to this generational thing because I think that's, that's a huge gap um, in the department. Um, but it's especially important for younger employees to, to feel like diversity matters and for them to feel valued and appreciated. And so things like allowing the officers to wear braids or dreadlocks, um, we've changed our policies to allow for that. So that's some of the things we've done. Um, I know when Mr. Collier was talking, I, I, I was tired listening to him because we've done most of what he, he talked about. And so... Um, I appreciate how you you kept all of that in the top of your head too. <laughs> I couldn't tell if you were reading from any notes, but you did, uh, you, you ticked it all off. So thank you. But that's kind of what Louisiana has been doing. We, we've really been struggling on the vacancies that we have um, as everybody is. And so we've been trying to, to actively trying to, to see how we could reduce that number. Thank you. Thank you much. Jimmy, I see your hand up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So I want to add a little bit to what Tanisha said, I think. And one, one, one thing I think that, you know, when you start, when we talk about vacancies, we can't forget about the number of people that are off on a particular day on FMLA, annually, sick leave. So when I started looking at that, you know, we have 850 vacancies on any given day and half of, half of 400 more on some type of leave. So that's 1,200 vacancies on a staff of about 4,000, you know? So we're looking at a 30% vacancy rate in particular that we have to feel. I made that point clear with, with Senate Finance last week. Um, so I, I just, I wanted to say that for those that when they start looking at vacancies, if they aren't considering that, that's a, that's a big, big challenge too. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and this is, you know, this is the environment. We, we are, we had a recommendation in capital outlay, which we have no reason to believe that we're not gonna get it on air conditioning our prisons throughout. 
Um, I, I firmly believe, you know, our, our prisons are on air conditioned. So that environment is makes it even more challenging. So I, I'm, I'm certainly encouraged by them giving us the money, roughly $30 million to, to air condition our, our eight prisons that we have, state prisons. So uh, again, important. Um, another thing, and we haven't done this yet, is is in specialized areas like in our segregation areas and actually when it, when a person's uh, working that area that they get higher pay. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are doing that, but but we are looking at that as a payroll issue, but no different than when COVID, we were paying people a little extra that were working in a COVID environment and we had we had to track that by payroll. So we can track that kind of stuff because I know, you know, like in our segregation areas, we have some turnover in those areas. So somebody has to be called in and when they work in that, that post, they should be getting that additional pay. So similar to what y'all talked about earlier. Uh, and, and Tanisha covered the rest, I think, for us in pretty good fashion. I, uh, I you know, we down, we, I, we had a, a, a very, as she said, a very minimum pay raise, a, a special interest rate is what we call it, 10%. So it affected up to lieutenant, I believe, somewhere in that area. And we, you know, that was last July and we down almost 200 positions and vacancy since that time. So that has definitely hadn't been the answer for us. Uh, and a lot of the wellness stuff y'all talked about, I think is a key component of this and, and uh, important that how we treat our, our staff and how the, you know, the training part of our supervisors, making sure they do the right thing and the way they treat uh, staff fairly. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in this afternoon. Thank you, Brian, appreciate it, man. Thank you, Jimmy. Y'all done a lot of really good work, so appreciate you sharing. Uh, Dan? Thank you very much. I'm Dan Michella. I am the Chief of Management Services with the Idaho Department of Corrections, and I, I must say it's uh, impressive to be a part of this and hearing about all the great stuff that you folks are doing. With Idaho, um, we've been focusing on both the, the, the front door and the back door, as we say. Um, you know, after raising starting pay to $19 an hour, we found ourselves getting uh, folks in the front door, uh, but we saw folks continuing to leave through the back door. So we, in, we instituted both a signing bonus and then also a retention uh, bonus program, and we saw success with both. Uh, we did see, uh, you know, take up as was referenced earlier uh, with some retirements uh, coming out of the pandemic. We're in the process now of streamlining our recruitment process to move applicants through each step of the funnel more rapidly. We're trying to maintain contact with the applicants throughout each step of the process, including through text messaging. And then we are in the process right now revamping our marketing elements through a recently hired agency and are in the process of rolling out a new uh, refresh of our marketing elements through largely social media. Um, we're, we're still, you know, as we're focused on getting folks into the top of the funnel, uh, really focused on retention and culture. One question I have for this, this group, is anyone doing anything as it relates to, you know, housing costs and the increase in housing costs that that younger folks, especially at the starting pay level, are having to deal with. So I'd, I'd love to hear from folks about that. Anyone have anything on housing? I know Texas, on some of our facilities, we've got housing and we use it, but not everywhere. So that that's really not a good one. Monroe, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dan, we're, uh, it's funny you, you brought that up. We're just now pricing out so uh, fortunately, Delaware is a small state. Our training academy is central uh, in the capital here. But uh, if you live within 70, uh, 70 miles, outside of 70 miles from our training academy, uh, we're looking at putting you up in a local hotel. So we're costing that out now. It's probably going to be about $7,000 per cadet. Typically, anywhere from five to 10 cadets may reside outside of that 70-mile radius. Uh, and I know some of my friends from New Jersey and New York here, but we, we tend to recruit a lot of people from New York and they drive down every single day and they're here at 7 a.m. So we're looking at putting them up in a local hotel. So uh, that just uh, happened the last couple of weeks and hopefully our next class uh, will be able to put that in motion. Uh, 
And then what about relocation? Is anyone uh, utilizing uh, relocation reimbursement as a recruiting tool? Anyone? Tennessee will, offer, Tennessee will offer relocation on a case by case basis. Okay. So, Dan, in California, we do have housing stipends for uh, hard to fill areas that have high cost of living. Um, and they're paid annually. And I believe they're paid, it's broken up, it's, excuse me, it's broken up monthly, but it's an annual lump sum that they break up monthly for. Um, especially our COs that are going to Bay Area um, and some of our other bright high cost of living areas in California. And I can share that uh, the numbers with you if you're interested. Yes, very much, Emery. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Also see in the comments that um, looks like Washington is doing offering relocation on a case by case. Colorado play, is paying a stipend for housing as well. Okay. Thanks, guys. Definitely lots of good information. Does anybody else have anything you want to share or something you want to throw out for the group? Okay. In the interest of trying to round out a meeting in the time of no more than an hour, um, I'll try to wrap it up. But I just want to say one hats off to everyone. Oh, Jimmy, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mention is that we are looking at providing transportation either, you know, bus transportation or, or, you know, vans, whatever. So with the price of fuel, we are setting up spots to pick people up to bring them to work. As you may can imagine in Louisiana, we have a lot of rural prisons. So that means a lot to the staff to do something like that. Very good point. Anyone else? Hey, Director Collier, I just wanted to double check with uh, Patricia Coyne Fake. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Did you get your answer about uh, without a test? How do you evaluate the candidates? And doesn't that open you up to accusations of bias without an objective tool like a test? Patricia, I can share a little on there, but I'm kind of like Jeff. I, we looked at our test that we had and basically identified that that's really not telling us if you can be a good staff member that wasn't really measuring what you need to do the job so we rolled away the test and essentially your academic performance in the academy has to be up to par as well as your physical performance in the academy is what we did so we go through an interview process uh, with all applicants and we have a process looking at the background and other factors but uh, we look pre-COVID at putting in place I think South Carolina maybe a couple of other states that use a pre- it's like a, it's not really what I'd call a full length psychological evaluation, but it is a uh, condensed version of an evaluation of the person to see if they're maybe fit for the job. Uh, we didn't do that and have not done it, but we did look at that pre COVID. But at this point, I would probably wait until I hopefully get better. Any, yeah, anybody? I, have that, that concerns me, uh, actually, because I mean, after our all the fun we've had with the DOJ, to not have some sort of objective tool. I mean, if you're basing it on a, an interview or whatever, I mean, um, I really, I, to me, that feels very risky because if you, you know, in our, our lawsuit was unintentional discrimination. It was the test that was bad. Um, but even at that, we, you know, it was, it's been very painful. And I feel like a process that is mainly subjective um, could really get, could re, you know, I, it's not, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't like get a different test, um, but I don't think I would want to have a, a situation where there's no test for admission to the academy. I think that um, that's, that's a real roll of the dice. I think it probably Just would my two to what the, what the, no, I appreciate that. And the test that we had was really measuring I would say a marker of less academic, more, it was really looking at some of the same factors Jeff was talking about. So to me, not really what I would consider a valid assessment. You may have a very comprehensive or had a very comprehensive one, and I could certainly understand that. Our screeners have 
uh, objective criteria they use to get to their scoring system. So even though it's an interview, it's somewhat uh, covered, but haven't had any concerns about it. Although I still have concerns sometimes that we hire anybody who mixed their boxes. And, and as a result, we end up, that adds to our retention issue, I think, by hiring some of the wrong folks. I see Colorado uses a suitability assessment, and that may be what I was trying to spit out a minute ago that we were looking at before COVID. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to honor the hour and just tell y'all, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I think we truly gain the most from this by talking to each other and learning what may be working or what isn't working. So I thank you very much for your input, for those of you that shared and all the ones that were on the call. I hope it was helpful. Again, this one will do a regular committee meeting uh, in a couple of months, but then we'll open again in May or June timetable for anyone that wants to be on the call. And again, thank y'all all very much. Kevin, thank you and the CLA crew for putting everything on. And everyone, please have a good rest of the day and a good week.